combining the designs of the Rolex Daytona and the Omega Speedmaster. This is going to be interesting. Could we make something out of these two that could work, though? And what would happen hypothetically if the two brands made one? These two watches are great and have been paired against each other just as much as their diver counterparts, the Submariner and the Seamaster. And though they are chronographs and share a few common similarities, they are both completely different. Welcome to a segment where I take the designs of two well-known watches and splice them together, highlighting elements of each that add the most amount of character to the respective pieces, with a goal to share an almost equal amount of DNA between them, and ultimately to bring devotees on both sides together, or try to at least. It's important to note that these two watches shouldn't be compared against each other. Making comparative videos with an incentive to find a winner with a totalitarian answer about which is better and which is worse has been done to death. There is no point in dividing the community. We can agree that both of these models have an equal standing, though their backgrounds are different. Many years later, we can see the appeal that they have generated for themselves. What makes these two watches so interesting to pair against each other is that there are devotees on both sides of the argument. But with any typical bell curve, the majority can look at them and appreciate them for different reasons. Where to begin? These two chronographs do not share the same background as the Sub and the Seamaster shared, obviously. They aren't dive watches. They were in direct competition with each other in the later part of the 1950s, both vying to become racing chronographs. But when the 60s rounded the corner, the Speedmaster won the contract, it went to the moon and back, and Rolex, who had full intention of winning the contract, branded their dials with the name Cosmograph, but it never left the Earth. So the Speedmaster became the space watch, and Rolex, though being a late bloomer, became more and more popular as a style and fashion accessory first. Now it is known to be a massive collectible. We look at these two watches and see that they both have an appeal for different reasons, and that's what makes each of them charming. Within these two lines, we see many variants. Broad arrows, pre-moons, pump pushes, oyster sotos. If we were to look at the full historical coverage of each, we would be at it for hours discussing the nuances that each generation brought to the table. To make this comparison simpler and easier to bring together, we will be looking at the most modern archetypes of both. The Speedmaster Professional, the Moonwatch, and the Rolex Daytona Ceramic, reference 116500. Both of the models chosen will use a black color scheme, and both have very different aesthetics. Maybe in the future we can look at the Panda aesthetic and how it holds, but for right now, I wanted to keep the playing field level with a simpler arrangement of colors. Let's break down the designs of each. Referring to the Speedmaster first, the design of the case celebrates a concept of flow, and addresses the approach in a unique way, with the inward twisting of the lugs known as liar lugs. It's not a rigid up-down case design, and instead attempts to bring down the overall presence that both the case and the lugs have on the wrist in favor of the dial. The professional does this extremely well. Your eyes are almost led along the sharp, polished surface to the watch face. The case design of this piece looks extremely modern. Even today, it's difficult to clarify when it was first produced. Holding on this, we should look at Greco design motifs that seem to translate through the entire watch. And this is quite fascinating. The hippocampus, the omega symbol, the arrow hand for the chronograph running seconds, paired with these organic lugs, they all speak to a styling from another time, another era, we could say. It makes you think that this watch could have been worn by someone in ancient Greece, and it probably wouldn't look out of place when we compare it next to the styles of the iconic Corinthian helmet. See how the lugs, in a way, mirror the cheek guards, how the sharpness of the edges managed to lead to a rounded form of some kind. There is a lot of function to them, but there is beauty to their forms. This term of flow, of accentuated edges, that seem integral to their aesthetics. It's finding that balance which makes a great design, one of ornate beauty that is also usable. Fascinating that when we look beyond the designs, we can see and pair them with elements from the past. One of the most integrated elements is the way that the crown recesses into the case. The case acting as the crown guard is an excellent use of thought and material. It does make you question why other brands don't use a similar approach with their pieces. Contrasting that with the Daytona, the design of the case is very simple, very manufactured, industrial, one could say. High polish on the flanks, typically a brushed surface on the top of the lugs, 
not with the modern Daytonas though. The benefit of the Daytona case design is that it mirrors the early five digit reference cases. The lugs aren't unnecessarily thick for the sake of added wrist presence, which might appeal to a lot more people. The advantage that this format has is that there is a much better blend between how the lugs integrate with the case and the bracelet with these references. Also notice the divide between the high polish of the lugs, the brushing on the flanks of the bracelet, and the high polish on the center links. There is a very good relationship between the parts. Could we say that the Rolex looks at more of a Roman-inspired aesthetic then? One built with less ordainment, more functionally purposeful. We could use the Centurion helmet as a reference here. The format is lacking embellishment if we remove the red plume. So the legionary helmet with a proud brow ridge, extended collar plate, articulating cheek guards. Sure, they're not the most fashionable, but functionally they are excellent. Less impeding and more direct. There is also less of an organic movement between the parts and a more rigid assembly of the components. What can we gather then from the case designs? Like how the Speedmaster lug design pushes the attention of the wearer to the dial, the Daytona manages to do similar, actually giving us a more proportionally balanced distribution between the elements. After looking at the cases, now we see something that is quite different between the two, the dial architecture. Where we would expect to see the Speedmaster following through with a fluid, adventurous approach with their dials, and the opposite with the Rolex, we actually see the roles reversed. The Speedmaster has a dynamic looking case, but its dial very much looks like an instrument. It is incredibly simple, highly functional and easy to read. I don't think many could deny that this is one of the greatest dial designs on any watch. It appears to resemble a cluster of gauges from a spacecraft. It has a touch of modern with a touch of retro styling, high contrast. But what makes it more special than most in this category is that the eye can easily break away from each element, whether being able to distinguish the time or read the chronograph subdials individually, it's effortless. So the emphasis on the dial seems to lean more towards the functional aspect of the chronograph and legibility instead of being the fashionable. It is very utilitarian in nature. The Daytona, with a more rigid, manufactured case, adopts a more playful approach to its dial. We could use words like charismatic to explain the arrangement. There is almost an expression to its face. The model has received revisions over the years, but the modern approach of hollowing out the subdials has made the Daytona unique in this category, and there are few others in the industry that use this direct method. The arranging of the subdials with a what we could call skeletonized aesthetic does a few things. It allows the dial to breathe more. It takes the emphasis and heaviness away from the subdials in an effort to make the watch hands more readable. We could say that where the vintage Daytonas, which opted for a more simplistic approach with pronounced subdials, were more focused towards being instruments first and a watch second, this approach aims to level the playing field. The greatest issue with chronographs is sharing a balance between time-telling and chronograph functionality. Some watches manage to approach their pieces better than others, and what the Daytona has managed to do with these newer references is a show a defined approach that is unique to their pieces, and b attempting to balance this idea of making the dial legible and easy to read while still having the ability to read the chronograph. As far as internal functionality goes, the watches share different movements, obviously. One is a mechanical hand-wound cam-operated chronograph, the other is an automatic column wheel chronograph. Good thing we're only focusing on the aesthetics then. So with all of these functional and aesthetic details out of the way, how could we go about combining them? My thinking around this was quite simple. Take what both watches offer the best of and blend them together. So by dividing up and beautifying these components, we are left with what I have called the Cosmograph Professional. And it's quite impressive to see the near equal sharing of parts between these two watches. What do we have? First, make the watch waterproof by incorporating a screw down crown and push a set. The main winding crown is slightly larger, sharing a bit of inspiration taken from 1960s Ministry of Defense Seamasters. This will probably mean that the watch uses an automatic chronograph, maybe some kind of hybrid between coaxial technology and a column wheel system. The case and the dial we can see is largely Speedmaster based, mainly because the aesthetics of the Liar lugs look more visually impactful, a nice blend of brushing and polishing. 
and the dial with its simple type and monochromatic setting is easier to use for the purpose of being an instrument. I may have also gone a bit mad and widened the case to accommodate the pushes and crown for the sake of protection. It does break the flowing lines of the case and feels a lot like something out of the 70s, a bit more space age. But hey, if you prefer the more rugged X33 styled model, this might be an option. Looking at the dial in more detail, replacing the standard baton layout of the dial with a set of Daytona plots adds more visual complexity to the dial. And just a bit more detail to one part of the arrangement that could use a bit of spicing up. The plots also add a bit more of a organic nature to the case. At the 12, a combination of both the Rolex and Omega logo. A sharing of the two words cosmograph and professional beneath. These components don't look too visually heavy. This arrangement uses a set of lines instead of one large paragraph. And the last two improvements, a simpler ceramic bezel from the Daytona, making the watch less scratch prone, obviously. It's also easier to read and less cluttered next to the Omega variant with many more numbers. Interestingly, the typefaces between the bezel and the subdials share many of the same elements, so they manage to go together quite well. Lastly, when deciding on bracelets, the Daytona bracelet won. It's cleaner, it's more precise, it melds nicely with the Liar lugs. Together, they actually look like they were made for each other, more natural feeling and easy on the eyes. So the modifications made, I can count eight changes. And this was a very enjoyable exercise because the end result, at least, I don't believe goes against the identities of either. The additions are there for the sake of improvement instead of being add-ons for the sake of combining parts. The aim was to never discredit these watches or show that one is superior over its competition. But the question that needs to be asked, one that is open to your interpretation, is does this combination work? Things like, would the watch work better in a smaller size? with smaller indexes, smaller crowns? Does it need to be waterproof? Does it need more detail on the dial? Those minor elements are the kinds of things that can be modified as the iterative process continues. But is this a clear proof of concept that an idea like this would interest you? That is the ultimate goal at the end of the day. And your feedback around this would be great. Well, the Cosmograph Professional was good fun to put together. Shall we do more of these? And I would be very interested in reading your suggestions on what we could combine next. The funnier, the better. There are plenty of opportunities out there, and maybe we can turn this into a series.